congratulations on uh, getting it out to the bookshelves and uh, tell us how it's gone so far. Well, so far, so good. Yeah, I'm fired up about the whole deal. I've got an excellent response, uh, especially from <laughs> Auburn fans. The Auburn fans, my social media is, has lit up, you know, and I've had several responses. Uh, I've done well over 35 podcasts slash radio shows and I've got great responses to that. So it's, it's going, it's going great so far. Uh, uh, these, uh, I'm coming to Auburn next week. Uh, on Thursday, I'll be there and we're going to, looks like we're going to be a, doing a book signing, uh, probably at J and M at, uh, we haven't finalized it yet, but we're looking at Friday uh, and Saturday, uh, early in the morning. So I, I'll keep people posted on that through my social media as we go. Maybe we should get Trey on the line here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just had him on the line. <laughs> yeah, I got you. But Jason, I didn't even realize that you did the forward for the book until I was looking at it this morning. But uh, tell me a little bit about that and and writing the book and, uh, and I mean, writing the forward to the book and what that was like. Yeah, Coach hit me up and wanted me to give uh, give my two cents on uh, <laughs> on my experience at Auburn and uh, and everything and the times when he came in and and how everything how we connected uh, you know me being from Mississippi and him from the West Coast you know how we uh, made two different languages come together <laughs> but also <laughs> I still don't speak <laughs> yours <laughs> I think you speak mine but I still don't speak yours <laughs> yeah it's almost hard impossible to speak mine uh, but I tell you what though so we just talked about you know our experience together and uh, through the 2004 season, I got to tell everybody. I said I wish I had him in 2003 and 2004 because we'd have broke every record at Auburn, and um, and you know we really would have, you know, had two great seasons back to back. But uh, you know, like I said, unfortunately, you know, we only had him for a year, and we was able to put together a lot within that one year. But uh, it, sometimes it, it doesn't. Sometimes it, it makes you a little anxious. Sometimes to think about what could have been if I'd have had him for two years. Uh, Couldn't imagine four. But uh, I say, yeah. you know, it's, it's a great experience to be able to be a part of it and uh, and everything. And and to hear him actually write the book and, and get it going out there, I think it'd be a treat for everybody to go back and relive that season. I was just reading your numbers this morning from 2004. 188 for 270, almost 70% pass completion, 2,700 yards and 20 touchdowns. That's pretty impressive uh, football season. Yeah, that's not even playing in three games in the second half because three teams were blowing out. And, uh, you know, we got pulled out of the game kind of early <laughs> just because they want to protect our health and everything for the season. But, you know, a lot of a lot of teams were just padding stats. So most of my stats came in a game situation where the game actually, actually meant something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one stat, Doug, that, that doesn't get talked about enough, and I think maybe you got to be a little bit of a football connoisseur to appreciate was – uh, he averaged over 10 yards an attempt. Well, just, and a lot of people don't, they don't look at, they don't even know what that means, right? But just by comparison, uh, Matt Leinard won the Heisman Trophy that one year and averaged 8.8 .8 an attempt. Matt Leinard threw for 66% completion and Jason threw for over 69% completion. But it just gives you a, a, an appreciation but what he accomplished in 2004 compared to what was supposedly the best player in the country. Right. And when I read the forward, the main thing that I take out of that is when Jason heard, let it go, uh, that kind of resonated with him. Coach, talk about that a little bit and, and what you saw in Jason coming in and, and what you got him to do on the football field that year. Well, the first thing, because he didn't know me, I didn't know him. We we're, we're kind of from completely different backgrounds. Okay, <laughs> this, I mean, I always said I'm seeing California is a long way from Auburn, Alabama, or Taylorsville, Mississippi, in more ways than just miles, if you know what I mean. Okay, yeah. so I come in there. The first thing you got to do with a with a guy with that kind of talent, but really hasn't performed like I know he can, but I could see it on the video. It's not it wasn't hard. Is you got to build some trust. The one thing I saw with Jason when I studied his video is he's really accurate. That was not an issue. The ball was always around the receiver. But because they were such a run-first offense, 
when he was there, at least the year, previous season. I don't think quite as much the season before that, but in, in 2003, the quarterback was not featured much. The running backs who were good, and you can kind of see why they were run first offense, were featured. But it got put into some a lot of must-pass situations. You know what I'm saying, Doug? Where he wasn't thrown on, on down in distances that were favorable to completions, if that makes any sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we had to kind of build, you know, Steve Ensminger had done a pretty good job with his fundamentals. I I I, ref, I continued to refine those, but fundamentally he was a pretty good quarterback. But the accuracy was the one thing I really liked. I said, this kid can hit these these passes like he's hitting them. We just got to put him in more situations where it's conducive to hitting those passes. You, you know what I'm saying? So we had to build him a little bit from the ground up, but mostly from the neck up because he had created in his mind, and he I think he'll confirm this because we talked at nauseum about it, that he was afraid to fail too often. And he didn't want to be the guy that blew the game. And he didn't really blow the game. He, he didn't because so much of it was, was put on the run game uh, that's really where you point the finger more often than not when they didn't. But the quarterback always takes hits. And I mean figuratively and literally, okay? So when he came in, I knew that was a fragile situation. He was not a sensitive kid, but he, he was keenly aware of what had happened in the past. And he didn't know me from Adam. So I got to build the trust that I'm going to try and put him in situations where he can succeed. Hence, everybody else would succeed. Mm -hmm. The nicest surprise about the whole thing was the wide receivers. That's now we knew about the backs, right, Jace? There were any questions yep. about the backs. All right. He knew about the receivers because he'd worked with them in practice, but they just weren't being featured much. And it was because the quarterback wasn't being featured much. Well, when I got to Auburn, I went through spring football. I came out and said, Man, we got some whiteouts. We're pretty good, but mm -hmm. I never saw, other than a play here and a play there, I never saw any reason to get excited about that position. But and I put it in the book. I said the uh, the receive uh, the re receiver in surprise. They were the surprise, and they put us over the hump. Jason was the straw that stirred the drink, but the receivers were the surprise of the offense. Jason, um, tell me about meeting Coach Borges, and as as I was saying before, uh, let it go when he said that to you. <laughs> Did that kind of break the ice? Yeah, I remember when I first uh, first met him. You know, he had this Hawaiian shirt on, and you know, I knew he had coached uh, at UCLA. And at the time, I knew about Cade Cade uh, who was a, a really good quarterback. So I knew his history as far as developing quarterbacks. And uh, so, you know, I knew I was in for a good treat. And like I said, it was just his demeanor uh, when you know he came in, how he approached me, and and uh, it, instantly he gave me confidence. You know, he didn't come in trying to change a whole lot about me. He just came in trying to instill confidence, like he said, trust and, uh, you know, just in what he's trying to do and what he wants to do with me and not just with me, but with the whole offense. And because, you know, Ronnie Brown had to trust him as well, too. You know, Ronnie was a guy that they didn't feature him a whole lot until, you know, Cadillac got hurt, but they wasn't utilizing any of our bats as much in the passing game. And, you know, so he pretty much – evolved our whole offense and and like you said when I when we were out to practice you know we would stay out to practice and do work on certain drills and and work on progressions and you know certain checks and different things there was not one time I went to the line of scrimmage where I was confused uh if I went to the line of scrimmage and I saw a certain blitz I knew how to get a side of it because we worked on it and you know and what we do in the classroom we was able to take out to the field and that's the most important thing about playing a quarterback position is being able to take from the classroom out to the field and, and, and get it going. I just feel like overall, you know, like I said, and honestly, I never tell anybody, you know, because I don't like making excuses, but like you saying, I wasn't really featured in the offense out of my junior year. Uh, I was featured actually more my sophomore year than I was my junior year. Uh, just, and I just think a lot of that was just the inner experience at the, at the coordinator position uh, that year. Uh, no one on the offense really had coordinator experience. And, you know, we was trying to find out a way to, to run an offense, you know, with a lot of different guys having a lot of different opinions. And I remember one time in the Mississippi State game, Lack had six touchdown rushes in the Mississippi State game my junior year and, you know, and everything. So, you know, we was a very run heavy team. And I remember coming out of high school, out of, out of Taylorsville, I was the number two ranked quarterback in the nation at the time behind Brock Berlin in uh, 2000. And, I was recruited from all these colleges all over the nation for my passing ability. 
and I got to Auburn, they was a passing team in 99. And then once I got there, they got Rudy Johnson. And ever since Rudy came in there, they went to, you know, straight running the ball a whole lot. And, you know, so nowadays where you see offense, they try to tailor offense around what the quarterback can do really well. It was the opposite of me. I had to basically go from throwing the ball 25, 30 times a game to only getting 12 to 15 opportunities to throw a, throw a pass in a game. And for me, I have to change into the system that we run instead of the system being fitted around the quarterback. And I just think Coach Borges for coming in and giving an opportunity where he really put the system around the quarterback and kept our run game, but just tailored around our receivers as well, where he utilized everyone's ability to be able to go out and, and explore. That's the difference between great coaching and just being a coach. You know, and I always tell people, great coaches know how to utilize their players they're not stubborn to the point where they make you fit their system. They fit the system around their athletes and they let them guys go out and they play and their ability comes out. And that's when you get the best. I feel like for years, Auburn was always trying to fit us to just a run system. I was like, I wasn't a running quarterback coming to high school. I was a passing quarterback. The receivers, being over Manu, Omar, Aroma Shadu, Anthony Miss, Courtney Taylor, all those guys were receiving catchers coming out of high school. And I remember when they came there, part of the recruiting thing was that we was going to throw in the ball. And that's why they decided to come to Auburn. And there was many times, man, we used to sit in the locker room and just as, as players, you know, not selfishly, but just be like, man, like we're just underutilized and they don't even really give us the opportunity to show what we can do in our passing game. The only thing they want to do is just run the ball in three clouds of dust mm -hmm. and uh, and everything. And, and you know, of course, we wouldn't come out and say it at the time, but it was very frustrating and, and everything. But I remember talking to my dad about it one time and, you know, I almost left Auburn. And a lot of people didn't know that. Ronnie almost left. And, you know, he you know, told me about, hey, no, you know, you sign up for something, you stick it through, and it's all going to work itself out. You just got to trust God and continue to keep moving forward and just work, just keep working, and it's all going to come together. And, and truthfully, it did. And I think I'm thankful that I never left Auburn. And because I feel like I'm family there um, from how I came from my freshman year all the way through my senior year. And, you know, you go through the highs and the lows and, you know, I just feel like uh, Coach Borges really put the icing on the cake uh, uh, over our careers at there at Auburn. I just think enough doesn't really get talked about our 2014. I know everyone talks about the 2010. Everyone talks about some of the recent years. But it feels like the 2014 has been lost. And I feel like we probably was the best all-around football team to ever come through Auburn. Yeah. Coach, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, a lot of compliments in there toward you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to take credit for it, but I was just trying to drive the car a little bit. I wasn't really, I wasn't the engine. Uh, I didn't score any touchdowns. But what we had to do, and I talk about this in the book quite a bit, is assess. I have a whole chapter pretty much about assessing the offensive talent, seeing which each kid brought to the table uh, as we devise the offense, okay? But not having the offense and then just trying to fit in square pegs into round holes. We had, we won uh, because we played great defense. We lead uh, country's leading scoring defense. That was huge. Not talked enough, not talked enough about, but, but on offense, what we did is we had guys that fit roles really well. Okay. You had Devin and Roma should who could blow the top off of coverage. Anytime could run like the wind. He was Jason's go-to guy when he wanted to go deep. And unless he was doubled, Jason was going to take that shot. We had Courtney Taylor, who was a great inside cut guy, taking balls and doing dirty work and run after catch. He was without question, I thought, the best run after catch receiver we had and a great blocker. We had Ben Abamanu, who was the perfect combination of the two. Very smooth out of cuts, excellent hands, and good on 50-50 balls. Really, really good. And then we had a, a, what would probably be considered an atypical slot in Anthony Mix. Most slots today are little guys, you know, uh, uh, stop and go dudes, run a lot of option routes, which Anthony did. But Anthony played the position a little different. He he could manhandle linebackers and nickelbacks because he was 240-something pounds at 6'5". He'd go in there and just – he could throw people out of the way, you know. He could muscle the ball if you threw him a slant. Like I remember Mississippi State, we threw a slant. Jason threw a slant to him, and the coverage is fairly tight. He, the body was so big, they couldn't do anything with him. So he fits such a great role that way. And then we had two backs. 
one, both of them tailback or halfback skill sets, but one that had a profile that could also play fullback and was willing to do it. See, some guys have that, but they're not willing to do it. But Jason or uh, Ronnie Brown was willing to do it. And that really was a huge part. Then we had Jake Slaughter, who was a pure fullback, wasn't going to get the ball, but he could do some of the dirty work and take the pressure off of uh, off of Ronnie. So we had a bunch of good role players, a great offensive line, a left tackle that blocked out the sun. He was huge. He never had to worry about the quarterback getting blindsided. <laughs> ben Grubbs, who turned out to be one of the a really good NFL player, but excellent for us. Jeremy Engel, who directed traffic inside. Danny Lindsay, who was the heart and soul of the offensive line. Tough guy, got the most out of his skills. And Troy Reddick, speaking of tough guys, was just an animal in there who got every ounce out of his skill. So we just, we had a good synergy. We had guys that fit. You know what I'm saying, Doug? They all fit. Okay, I want to do this. I knew just who to do it with. You know what I mean? Because I got a quarterback and get him the ball. If the quarterback couldn't give him the ball, it's all moot, moot right? Uh, we're going to go deep. I got a guy to do it. You know, we want to have somebody block the outside linebacker. I know who can do that and do it consistently. So the roles all fit. Yeah. Let's talk about the season just a little bit. Uh, you get through the first couple of games and then you have LSU uh, against a, a guy coaching LSU named Saban. Uh, so the the ending to that game that march down that field had to bring uh, a lot of confidence in the third game of the year, I think, Jason, right? Yeah, yeah, it was our third game. That's, uh, we always played the LSU uh, third game of the year. And like I said, they was defending national champs. And and what people don't realize that we, that week is uh, Hurricane Ivan. So the school was kind of let out. So most of the students was was all gone. Campus was a ghost campus. Right. And they, they ended up putting us at the Auburn Hotel uh, right there close to the to the university and we was in there pretty much doing walkthroughs and you know tossing the ball around inside the uh inside the ballroom and <laughs> and everything and, and that was our passing uh so you know it was fortunate enough that we had a lot of veterans on that team and you know coach borders and staff had us do a lot of walkthroughs and you know we do some jog throughs and, and things like that but we actually didn't didn't know we was going to play for real until Thursday morning which they we kind of speculated we still were based off what the weather was saying. But we couldn't get outside and actually do some form of a practice, I believe, until like Thursday evening or Friday morning. So our actual real time of getting a chance to throw live passes, I believe, came on that Friday, the day before the game. So we basically went through that game. And, you know, that was a great, great defense we played against. And, you know, it was NFL players all over the field. Uh, some of them guys I played against in the pros. And I remember us getting down to the two-yard line one time, and they stopped us. Uh, we tried a fourth down, and it got us. And then we ended up, you know, we would push the ball, sustain drives, but they played that that strong defense where they wouldn't just break when they get to the red zone. And we was kind of the same way as the defense. So it just went on game where it was a defense slugger fest. But offenses, we were still good. It's just the defense was just – they were going to make it hard as possible for you to get across that goal line. Mm -hmm. And – and, um, you know, but we st we kept we kept just sticking to it and sticking to it. And and that's just one of those games where I feel like maturity stood up. Uh, you know, our team kind of elevated off of it because we won one of those hard fault type of football games. And 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 at the time, like I say, you beat the team that you was chasing. You know, they had won the national championship. So in order to get to the national championships where they had a lot of those guys that came back, we knew we had to beat them. And um like I said, I just remember that last drive. There were so many signature plays in that drive. Um, you know, Ronnie, you know, making a, a great, you know, run on one of those plays where he went to two or three guys and had a tough run and Cadillac catching the screen uh, against Corey Webster, uh, which he played it really well. But Lack got in there and got the ball and made a, you know, a tough play for us. And then the, the two fourth down, with the fourth down play, uh, the Courtney, uh, Coach Borges knew. Um, we talked about it at the timeout. And we knew they were going to bring pressure. And anytime saving, if you got close to the red zone and, and him and uh, Coach Muschamp at the time was on that staff as a D coordinator, we knew they was going to bring some form of pressure and use an all blitz zero. And we was kind of set up to the boundary, uh, to the left side of the boundary. So we knew they was going to try to bring a corner blitz along with it. So what he wanted to do was get me out on the move, get me to the edge, you know, uh, let our guys kind of protect the front side and uh, let the furthest guy try to come. 
Uh, he may come a little free. If I back and chip him a little bit, great. If not, you know, hopefully we get the ball off. So we ended up doing a, a rollout pass and we ended up running a comeback to Courtney. We knew we'd get one-on-one -on -one coverage because it's blitz zero. And uh, I just remember seeing Courtney get to his, his spot and I kind of let the ball go where I figured he would be at and just put a little bit of air on it enough for him to be able to see it when he come out of the break because I knew I couldn't hold it any longer. Um, and uh, I just remember the crowd going crazy. I didn't really see him catch it and got up and, and saw he made a great catch and everybody going crazy. And then we also get to third and 12 situation. And now time is not on our side because if we don't convert this, the game's pretty much over uh, because, you know, it's less than a minute to go in the game. And I remember we motion Cadillac out of the backfield. We end up in an empty set. And, you know, we talked about what we get versus empty. You know, they'd probably give us some form of two high, form, some form of cover three, but we knew they wouldn't blitz us in that situation. Uh, so they stayed back in zone. We ran two double stick nod where being over Mono was the guy that opened up Courtney. So the safety had to make a decision off of do I cover Courtney? I mean, do I cover Ben or do I cover Courtney? So when Ben ran the route, he kind of jumped Ben a little bit and left Courtney open in the, in the back of the end zone because he was in the slot and Ben was the number one in that. So we ended up hitting Courtney back in the end zone. That's the loudest I've ever heard at Auburn. The stands was going crazy. People was going crazy. And that was college football at its best. And uh, I remember when we missed the extra point. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I was like, do you know how hard it is to try down the field? And we missed the extra point. And then, uh, luckily, they put that rule in place that summer where you can't land down on top of the center and just snap the ball. And uh, they did that, and uh, we didn't got a chance to get the re-kick and uh, Rose Green up, finishing up with the interception in the game. And that was a team victory. That's when I knew we was a team mm -hmm. because everyone in the locker room was just high-fiving each other. Everyone's going crazy, offense, defense. No one cared about who got the accolades or whatever. Everybody in that game made a special play, and uh, everyone had a hand in that game, whether it was a big-time block, whether it was a big-time catch, big-time run, big-time hit. Uh, Brett Eddins hitting the quarterback, Randall at the time, you know, a big time interception by Rose Green. Everyone played pivotal part in that game. And that's how it was for the rest of the season. Everyone just leaned on each other. Coach, how much, what were you thinking when the team was going down the field? Were you thinking these guys, they have it in them, they're ready for this? Or were you thinking, uh, you know, are we going to score or not? Or what, what was going through your mind there? Oh, I just thinking about the play sequence. That's all. I mean, I, I don't, I didn't really get anything other than that is how are we going to get this ball down the field? And that was foremost in my mind. And I just remember we did have a couple of pauses with timeouts where I got a chance to talk to Jason because we discussed that fourth and 12. Uh, but there were two plays that I mentioned in the book. Both of them were we dodged bullets. One was when, when Cadillac literally ripped the ball away from Corey Webster on the throwback screen. Because when he let that go, I go, oh, no. <laughs> and he took it from him. Now he'd take it from him. He gained some yards, too. Right. Then we had another one on the naked where we hit Anthony Mix in the flat. The ball popped up in the air, right? Remember that one, Jay? Yeah. And they, the guy caught it and tiptoed on the sideline. They called him out of bounds. It went to replay, and I'm going, oh, please don't be in bounds. Please don't be. And they called. They, you know, that the, the ultimate horror when I when I die, <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> – Upon further review, every time that comes out of a guy's mouth, I go, oh, what's coming next? But they said the the, the call is confirmed. I think first down Michigan or whatever, or first down Auburn. So you speak of Michigan. Uh, Auburn. So I, I swallowed hard, but it all turned out good. But there was, you know, there was a few in there we had to contemplate. And then when we got to the, the empty play, uh, they had not shown much blitz in empty, but uh, you don't know. I mean, the last time, but what happened is Jason had burned them on the comeback route to Courtney earlier. So I wasn't thinking much champ would blitz again because the last time that, you know, the defense coordinators, they, they got memories like elements. So this would be a good time to empty. Let's take a shot at it and see. We, I don't think we ran an empty play the whole game. I think that was it. That was designed for that area of the field. We practiced it in that area of the field. And fortunately they ran two beautiful routes. And that ball went up and I didn't think it was ever going to come down. It wasn't like it was, thrown real high or anything, but it looked like slow motion as Courtney caught the ball. So. Yeah. Uh, so you get through the point after in the LSU the game. Yeah. I call it the mulligan. We win that game. And, and then a couple of games later, uh, one of the significant games in my mind is the Tennessee game. When you go to Knoxville, uh, one of the games I wish I had <laughs> gone to. Um, but after that coach, you got to think, um, 
we got something special here. Yeah. I, I identify those two games in different ways. And Jason kind of alluded to it. When we beat uh, LSU, our team believed we could play with anybody because they just won a national championship, right? The year before. But when we beat Tennessee, our team believed they could beat anybody. We took Tennessee apart. The game was 34 to 10, but it was much worse than that. We just sat on the ball the second half pretty much and played ball control. And, but I think we could have scored a lot more points. But it wasn't close anyway. But I just think coming out of the game, it was a very confident group. And the leadership had taken hold. And you got to understand with this team, there wasn't one or two leaders like there are on most teams. We had lots of leaders. We had lots of guys. And, and they did not conflict. Their egos never got in each other's way. So uh, that game gave us the confidence to where I knew we'd take care of business in the games that we're supposed to win. There would be no letdowns. And there wasn't the rest of the season. Yeah. Almost a flawless uh, first half in Knoxville, right, Jason? Yeah, the first half we came out uh, came out rolling. I, I, I say this, you can feel the energy before the game started. Like, you pull up to that stadium, it's on the river. Uh, you know, there's 104,000 people in there and, and uh, singing Rocky Top. And, you know, you have your family session and part of your little band. And, and the rest of it is just us. And, uh, you know, and you go into the Lions Den. And we kind of watched uh, game day that day, college game day was there. And all we heard about was Tennessee, Tennessee, what Tennessee could do, or it was nothing about what we could do or what we was going to do. It was all about Tennessee. And, and we were just like, okay, you know, we always like when college game day is there and kind of not talk about us. So, you know, we kind of just like, hey, tonight we're going to put everyone on notice. And, and like I said, guys came out hungry and ready to play. And from tip off, you know, their energy was there. Uh, like I said, the one thing about our team, though, was we could overcome adversity. Um, you know, we had a couple of plays there, I believe, where Ronnie fumbled on the on the two yard line. We reached for the for the goal line. The ball came out. The very next play, we get the ball right back. You know, our defense goes out there and get us the ball right back. And then, you know, we end up dropping the ball. A Cooper Taylor on the on a Cooper Taylor. I mean, Wallace. Cooper Whoa. Wallace. <laughs> yeah, Cooper, Cooper Wallace on the uh, back of the end zone running an over route. And I remember it hit him in the chest and he kind of gave me that look like that you don't say nothing. <laughs> so we go back to the other beer in this play. We call uh, another pass play. We hit uh, Courtney, I mean, not Courtney, hit Ben on the slant play for a touchdown. And, you know, it was just one of those seasons where guys didn't flinch. And like I said, you have a turnover, you shake it off, you go back in and you regroup on the sideline, you come back out, it's like you never, it never happened. And, we came out and the guys were just making plays. We had great runs. The offensive line blocked their butts off. Like they really, really blocked their tails off in, in the passing game and in the run game. And when you were in 104,000 people, that's why when I was watching the game this past weekend, my wife had me at a wedding on college Saturday. So I'm at a wedding trying to watch the game on the phone. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm seeing you know, Tennessee and, and Bama play. And I'm just like, it just brought back memories of, a top 10 matchup when we played them up there and it was uh, at nighttime, a college game, they was there and it was and everything. And I just remember being in that stadium and, you know, and seeing what we achieve, you don't really appreciate things while you're in the moment, but when you have an opportunity to sit back and you look back over, over things and accomplishments and different things, you have a greater appreciation, uh, you know, for coaches and players uh, putting together how hard it is to be undefeated and how hard it is to, to win in the SEC. And uh, and like I said, the way we beat Tennessee up there, you know, their linebackers talking to us, the, my best time was the second time around because they said the first time we beat them that they didn't play their best game. It was nothing about how we played great. They, they said the best team didn't win and, and all of that. So that just kind of amped us up for the next time we got ready to play them. But I tell you, just playing up there in Knoxville in front of all those fans was just uh, – it was something I won't ever forget. Mm -hmm. So you get through the rest of the season, you go into Alabama and beat them in Tuscaloosa. Like you said, you go to the championship game and beat Tennessee again. You go to the sugar bowl and win that. Uh, you're 13 and 0, eight and 0 in the sec, I think, uh, but no championship out there, which is kind of the premise mm -hmm. for the book coach. Uh, what was, what was the feeling after that ball game? Do you remember? Well, 
you know, you're happy you won the game. You're undefeated. I mean, we were excited about that. But uh, it was a little disappointing, I think, for the players and for the coaches to not get to play for it. That's, you know, that, and that's the whole idea. The Deny of the Tiger is the mm-hmm. name of the book, and but it encapsulates everything about that. Now, it doesn't encapsulate the synergy of the team. And that should not be ignored because the team was a championship team. The team was the best team in the country. And I, I'll take that to my grave. And didn't get a chance to play for what they really should have got a chance to play for. But there was disappointment. But when it was all said and done, I think the kids, and I know myself as a coach, knew what they'd accomplished. And it was not hard to envision our team hoisting that trophy, even though we didn't get a chance to, because nobody beat us. You know, and most teams didn't even come close. I mean, there were a couple, but most teams didn't even come close. So uh, to have an SEC team go undefeated, not get a chance, we were the impetus, I think, for the playoff system today. It took a while, didn't happen overnight, but uh, what we did was incredible. And it was a, a great, not a good team, a great football team that just didn't really have any weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And speaking of the playoff, Jason, I know. Tell us, I know it had to be frustrating after the Sugar Bowl and not to get a chance to play for the championship, but uh, what did I know you think, what if there was a playoff now? Uh, and how much did this lead <laughs> to uh, a playoff coming about in college football? Yeah, I always tell guys, you know, I think the 2014 is the team that changed college football, uh, the Auburn football team, because that's when the speculation of the undefeated season, because there was four teams at the time undefeated, uh, USC, uh, Oklahoma, us, and uh, Utah. And uh, and that's the time that a playoff system would have been really great because, you know, I think Coach Urban Meyer, so Urban Meyer was the coach at Utah, and uh, Alex Smith was quarterback and, and everything. But like I said, from top to bottom, our team was deep, and we played the toughest schedule out of the four teams that was undefeated. Uh, you know, Oklahoma held on by thread not two times, but three times, they end up winning games right at the end. And uh, USC end up barely beating UCLA at the end of the game and no, barely beat Notre Dame that year because they got pushed into the end zone. So there was time, and the Virginia Tech team that we played had them on the ropes, had USC on the ropes, right there to the very, very end. So we knew we were going to be playing a very good Virginia Tech team in the uh, Sugar Bowl, and we knew they was, you know, one game away from actually having an opportunity to, to, to be where we wanted to be as well. And, uh, you know, Frank Beamer, Coach Beamer was a great coach and he knew he was going to get their tough shot. And and for us, it was all about the finish. Like we couldn't control no more about playing in the championship game, but we wanted to make sure that we finish because the season can't be special if we lose the one game at the end because we were worried about our feelings and how we didn't get a chance to play the national championship game. But we'll be remembered for a very long time if we go out here, we close this thing out and we finish the season 13 and 0 undefeated. And that's when you can either become legendary or you can just become, you know, someone that came through the program. And for us as seniors, we, we had meetings and we talked to guys about, hey, make sure everyone's locked in because we're on Bourbon Street. And, you know, a couple, a couple guys get a little loose, <laughs> but make sure everyone's locked in and ready to rock and roll when we get ready to play in the Sugar Bowl because – this is all about finishing what we started and going out of this thing the right way and to make sure that, you know, this is a season that will always be remembered. Whether they put us in a national championship game and they didn't, we know we're national champs. We go out and win this game because it is hard to go undefeated in the SEC. It's hard to beat a team twice. And on top of that, we played a very hungry team that wanted to defeat us in Virginia Tech. They talked noise all week long when we saw them on Bourbon Street. They talked noise all throughout the papers. And if you ever watched that game over, the first half was the first quarter was very, very heated. And the first half, for the most part, guys going at each other. Um, you know, they was a team that was kind of doing a couple of dirty things at the time. But I got to stay focused. And, uh, and like I said, we ended up going up 16-0. And like I said, we could have scored a little bit more. But, you know, Tubbs wanted to kind of take us off the, the brakes a little bit. I mean, off the gas a little bit and almost let them squeeze back into the game. They're late uh, and everything. But the overall, that season would go down. I still don't understand why we haven't been named national champs. And they're leaving it vacant because there was a team worthy of it. 
which I don't understand, but we did change college football and we gave it our teams that now have opportunity to play in the playoffs. It started to talk after 2004 and after about six years, it finally got implemented uh, around about six, seven years later. And now you see four teams going to the playoffs. Now it's about to be implemented to 12 here very soon. So, um, you know, like I say, we was a part of history and, uh, and we became legendary. Yep. Coach, uh, obviously a season that changed college football, a team that changed college football. Uh, in, in wrapping up here, tell us, uh, can you encapsulate uh, what made this team so special? Was it unselfishness or or what? Oh, well, yeah, kind of all of the above. Unse- uh, talent, number one, we were good enough. Because unless you're, you know, you don't have to be the most talented, but you have to be talented to get to that level of college football. We were very talented. That, so we had a good foundation. The second thing we had is a great worth ethic. And then we also had incredible focus. Part of that, I think, was the disappointment of the season before. Uh, I think that gave our kids a laser focus that was, they were willing to do anything it could. They wanted that anything that you asked them to do, if it meant winning, they didn't care. And the, and the last thing that occurs to me is leadership. We had so many leaders, so many solid leaders that would, you know, the guys that weren't as much the leaders, the leaders would drag them across the finish line. It's like Jason talking about, hey, we're playing in New Orleans. It's a lot of bad temptations in New Orleans, and it's easy to do something stupid. They weren't going to let them do it. They weren't going to let them do it. Got, that's the type of team it was, the leadership, the talent, the work ethic, and the, and the focus. All those things combined equal 13 and 0. 